Well, oh, yeah, we're going to do the uh, statue of Marcus for always. You're going to do what? The statue of Marcus. Oh, send that to me in the email. Okay. Uh, and so, time to start. Today, we'll talk about Byzantium, which is really the Byzantine Empire, and it is. It stretches uh, really about 700, 800 years. And it's where a lot of things that we recognize today get invented. And so the, Byzant the Byzantine Empire at the death of Justinian. Justinian is like kind of the big hero in today's lecture. Um, at in 565, there's a couple of places here I, I want you to see. And this is Nicaea. That'll be important. Constantinople, which is Byzantium and Istanbul. Ravenna, which is on the Adriatic Sea, and there's Rome, and this area here is Greece, it stays the same. I have another map, and I uh, wanted you to see this, and I put it a little deeper in here and that is this this is the byzantine empire in 527 and you see the pink these are the areas that Justinian conquered. So it has some of the same places, Constantinople. It doesn't have Nicaea there, but it does have Ravenna, Rome, and so on. And so the pink is what Justinian conquered. And Justinian came to power in the early fourth century, or me, excuse me, in the sixth century. And so uh, what he had around him was really um, an empire in decline. And I'll get here. And one of the big things that he did right off the bat was that he commissioned and had this, this cathedral built. It's named the Hagia Sophia, and it's in Constantinople. And you see it's 532, 537. I'll give you a little backstory on just uh, Justinian. Uh, he's called Justinian the first, sometimes Justinian the Great, and he came to power at a time when the Western Empire was in severe decline. And if you take a look at uh, historical accounts of the Roman Empire, a lot of times they just write it off as having uh, been, uh, as it had been gone by the year 500. But uh, Justinian was the emperor in Constantinople. And there was this, this kind of uh, seismic event that happened early in his reign. It's called the Nika Riots. And they started, uh, it's, the accounts of how this all started vary. They, some of them say it happened at the uh, Hippodrome or something. Anyway, 
aside from all of the origins, the true origins was that the people were uh, tax, felt like they were taxed too heavily, that they weren't getting enough to eat, their wages were down, just general discontent with the empire. And Justinian wasn't particularly a brave soul. I'm going to slide down here. He was about ready to leave. He wanted to flee Constantinople, but he was married to her, Empress Theodora. And I want to kind of start by saying, if you look up Empress Theodora, you'll find various accounts of her life. And her enemies through the years had tried to portray her as a prostitute and uh, other kinds of derogatory uh, descriptions. Bottom line is that that's kind of what's happened to women through history if they gain some kind of power or influence. That's not uncommon. And so, but she was the power behind Justinian. And so we'll go back here. Hagia Sophia, this was one of his first big accomplishments. And it had this dome. The dome was supposed to be the biggest in the world. And that's why he had the imported these guys, these, uh, these Greek architects. And you see, in a lot of ways at that time, a lot of the, a lot of the knowledge and a lot of the uh, smartest people were still in Greece. That happened all the way through the Roman Empire. They didn't have the army they had during Alexander the Great's time, but they still were way advanced in mathematics and uh, science and a lot of things. So anyway, but bottom line is that the first dome caved in and they had to rebuild it. It started out kind of a disaster, but they finished it, finished it. 537. And here is, here is a view of the interior. And it is a lot like some of the other churches that we've seen, all of these places of worship. First of all, I'd have you see that it is uh, devoid of pews. And that's really the same kind of thing that we've seen already in other uh, churches in the third, fourth, fifth centuries. And so no pews and elaborately decorated. And these discs around the perimeter Anybody know what that's all about? I'll give you a hint. Anybody know what this is all about? Well, Islam became a dominant religion in Turkey uh, in the 11th century or so, 10th, 11th century. And so this great Christian cathedral was converted to a mosque. And these structures are minarets. You'll find these on Muslim Islamic architecture. And, uh, and so anyway, these were added later, but the Hagia Sophia is a mosque and these discs represent, they are quotes from the Quran. They are Islamic. It's almost like uh, Bible passages. And we do that in Christianity as well, you know. Uh, John 
313. What is that? And he gave his son. I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. That kind of thing. Well, they do that in the Muslim culture. Right. And there and there's something else here too that I gotta point out. The Islamic culture comes out of the same tradition. Everybody in Islam, Christianity, and Judaism all go back to Abraham. They're called the Abrahamic religions. Yes. I did not know that. And I'm like actually like get into religion and stuff, but I did not know that. Oh, wow, cool. I'm glad. <laughs> yeah, I did not know that. Yeah. Abraham is the, the ghost. He is like really the founder of, of all three of those great religions. And, and there are a lot of people, if you get to know some Muslims, they'll tell you that they'll, they'll point out that there are a lot of, there is a lot of overlap and they don't see Jesus Christ as the Savior, the Messiah, but they do recognize him as a prophet. I'm a Christian. What? Is that a church? Yes, it was a church. It's an inside of the Islamic church, isn't it? Yeah, it's now it's now it's a mosque. <laughs> What's a mosque? A mosque is an Islamic church. Oh, okay. Yeah, a mosque, and if you were talking about it in Christian terms, it would be a cathedral. And they would call it the, the, the Cathedral of the Hagia Sophia. But it is now, it is a mosque. And I, if I could add a little something here, in like the 1930s, this was opened up so that uh, people could come in and see this. This is essentially a museum. Except a is this still a mosque or is is it mm -hmm. or like a museum okay. mixed with a mosque? Could I have check? Well, here's the thing. In a few years ago, and I forgot the date, I, I apologize, but it's on the record, they turned it back into a mosque. And as it is a mosque, the only people that can come in are Muslims, and the reason they come in is to pray. And so it's not a museum anymore that was reconverted back to a mosque. Um, this is not particularly unusual. There are sites here in, uh, in Istanbul, to be sure. But there are sites in Spain, for example. Uh, the place that was the mosque at Cordoba, Spain. Islam had been uh, the dominant religion in Spain for a few hundred years and they built mosque. And when the Christians took over again, they turned those mosques into churches or cathedrals, if you will. And so, yeah, we got this great uh, architecture that changes hands and it's essentially used for the same purpose, but by different religions. And so that's really the case of the Hagia Sophia. And to me, it's just really a shame, just in my own selfish way, I've never been here. I've known a lot of people that have been to the Hagia Sophia and they say it's magnificent and it's kind of sad that it is not a tourist destination. But there are places in other religions that only the believers can go. Uh, for instance, just right down the road, we have a church of the Latter-day Saints. They built they built a cathedral right there by CBC, right there on 40. I, saw, I see it's it every a, single time I like drive to school. It's beautiful. It and, the, and, 
and when they open that, it's really kind of new, actually. It looks new. Yeah, yeah I think it was like eight or ten years ago, maybe. Anyway, before it was consecrated, that was that it was blessed and turned in into the Church of Latter Day Saints. Uh, they had an open house that people could come in and see the architecture and all the wonderful images and so on. But once it was consecrated, the only people that can go in there were Mormons, believers in the, yeah. So this is not exactly just an Islamic thing. There are a lot of religions that there are places that if you're not a believer, you can't go there. And so anyway, um, I wanted to explain these discs too in the quotes from the Quran. Um, because we're all of the Abrahamic religions, uh, uh, most Muslims, and Muslims, Islam is not like a single thing. There are two main branches, Sunni Muslims and Shiite Muslims. And then they're kind of different, a little bit from place to place, but they believe just like Christians and just like Jews in the second commandment that you don't have these graven images. Uh, and so many Muslims take that very seriously. And if you don't believe me, and they don't really very sensitive about that. A few years ago, there was a French magazine that made cartoons of the prophet, which a lot of people around the world found extremely offensive and it sparked some violence too. It was had a terrible reaction. And so anyway, you know, this is where it all is. Um, and so the Hagia Sophia, here's a cutaway, a model. And, uh, and you can see here, it is still in, reasonably good shape for being 1,500 years old. And so that was the Hagia Sophia. And I talked to you about Ravenna. One of the things that Justinian did was reunite the Roman Empire. And Ravenna is on the Adriatic Sea. And I'll show you that map again. See, Ravenna is here. It's got a little X because it is actually a capital. It's a very important place. Uh, and this is what it represents a, a Byzantine victory. I'm sorry it's not in English, by the way. But at any rate, You're fine. yeah, Justinian had uh, conquered that. And Ravenna is a place where they built a lot of Christian churches. And they really kind of defined the architecture for um, Europe until basically until the Gothic age when uh, cathedrals started to become the architecture of choice. But bottom line is, is that uh, basically clay tiles and brick. You know what this thing is here? Anybody, help me out. Is that like an aqueduct type of thing? No, but it looks like it doesn't. It's what they would call a flying buttress. And it's embedded in this column and it's used to take some of the weight off of this column. And this is an invention that when we talk about Gothic cathedrals, these kinds of buttresses, these flying buttresses as they're called, 
will be all along the side of the cathedral and it makes it easier to build higher because the weight is spread out. And so it's basically a brace. And so San Vitale, and it's in the Justinian era. And here is the floor plan. And this is, we were talking about this earlier. This has been a kind of floor plan that we see in a lot of these, that there will be a circular area that's almost always in the center. And this is the domed octagon. The octagon is the perimeter and the dome in the center. Um, first quarter of the 11th century. This is much later, but it's still essentially the same kind of architecture. This is 500 years later. And look at this. Flying buttresses all along to support the weight and a central dome. And this is in Greece. And so anyway, got a little more to say about that too. But um, more from San Vitale, which is like a World Heritage Site itself. Um, Ravenna, Italy, it's, this is like, it's among the most magnificent. Then that's basically Justinian. He took back many of the areas that were previously in the Roman Empire and he built a lot of Christian churches along the way. And so uh, there, there's something here I want to talk about too because they use some of the, even though this is, these are centuries apart, I want to talk about the standard of Ur and how the central figure who was the king was taller and in the center. And that was the hierarchy of scale. And they're still doing this. And so Jesus, between two saints to between two angels, St. Vitalis and St. Ecclesius. And so, yeah, he's got the angels by him and then these holy people. But here he is. And there's something else to note here. Christ does not have a beard. And he does have that halo with the cross, which is a signifier. This is Jesus, but it's not that pronounced. And what they're doing, even at this date, is that they're still working on the iconography. How should Jesus be portrayed? And so with that, I wanna kind of go back a little bit And anyway, this is Justinian as world conqueror. And this was actually, uh, this is probably after Justinian passed away. And you can see he's a hero. He's reconquered uh, Michael the Archangel. Here's that San Vitale that we were just looking at. And that's where these murals are Justinian and Theodora. And so they are mosaics to be sure. I put a star by them because they're really important. Um, and they had a problem. And it kind of comes to a head in the next century or so. And the problem is this. How do you portray an emperor 
who is powerful and is a symbol of authority. And in this case, he's actually got a halo. And this was circa right after he died. So they pretty much considered him to be a saint. But how do you distinguish between an emperor and Christ? Uh, and there's another mosaic, another building in Ravenna. So we have this issue of how do you portray Christ? Actually, I just thought of something that I didn't think of earlier. There were some depictions, maybe I'll bring these later, uh, some depictions in the Greek tradition that portray Christ as king. And they portray him as royalty in other ways, the prince of peace, for example. But at any rate, this is 548, 565. And here we got basically the iconography that they'll settle on for the next 500 years to 1,000 years, almost a whole millennia of Christ depicted this way. First of all, he's got a beard. Second of all, he's got a halo, and he has the halo with the cross. So there's no mistaking Christ. He's barefoot, but Christ had lived a life of poverty. He just kind of was among the poor. That was his uh, following. That's who he ministered to. And we have this, this hand gesture, which is uh, a, a sign that it's like administer law or give pardon to. And so they still use that sometimes. It's kind of interesting. I saw this. You guys ever seen Schindler's List? And anyway, the commandant of the concentration camp, Oscar Schindler said that he convinced him that he would have more power if he would be more lenient to the prisoners in the con concentration camp. And he went around, let's say halfway crazy. We'll go around with these two fingers like this. I pardon you. You know, it's actually kind of funny, but not funny, too. Anyway, this is the iconography. This is what we'll see in Jesus. They'll change a few things. For instance, his hand does not have the wound from the crucifixion. And we'll see that kind of go back and forth, too. And likewise, I'm going to show you this. This is really kind of cool. I, and can you see that at home? The iconography of the Virgin Mary? Yes. Okay, good. Like I say, the technology is a little tricky on this side. So the Virgin Mary, they kind of come up with the standardized iconography too. And, and there's uh, issues here that uh, need to be considered when you take a look at this. This is a detail from a sixth century apse mosaic at Poric Cathedral, Croatia, which is not really far from Ravenna. And it's one of those places that Justinian took back. And again, like I say, they were building magnificent churches along the way. And so anyway, this is the, this is a Christian iconography.info, Mary Portraits. 
And so I, I got the hot link on the PowerPoint, but I want to show you this. This is a mosaic pictured above, was revolutionary. Before the fifth century, Christ had normally been pictured as an adult, flanked by saints and holding a book or a scroll. I'll show you some of that. That stays. But here we go. We talk about, here's a better picture of it. Um, here's Christ. And so this is another issue that, that needed to be resolved in the por portraiture of Mary and Christ the child. And so what you've got here, and this is the way it was typically portrayed, he's got his hand just like that with the administering the law, hardening <coughs> the idea that, that he is here to die on the cross to forgive us of original sin. That's what that is. And his face. His face is something of a child, but more like a grown adult, because you need to explain how it is that Jesus Christ, being God, the Son of God, being knowing everything, including his own fate and why he was here on this earth, And he's a child. And so how do you reconcile this? He's a child, but with all of this infinite knowledge. And so here he is, and he's holding a scroll. And, and he knows his fate. Uh, a couple of other things I wanted to say about this. This is uh, Mary it's the Madonna and child enthroned. And the idea, uh, this is a Greek term for this, Theotokos, the Virgin Mary as mother of God. And it came to be highly influential and the Christ child in, sits enthroned on the lap of his mother and uh, and that makes a gesture of delivering the law in the right hand, holding the scroll, as seen in earlier images of the Christ, the adult Christ. So you kind of have to make him a child, but you also have to use some of the visual language of Christ as the adult. And so... Uh, there are some other images here. This is really kind of interesting. The evolution of the Mary. And I showed you some, some Roman sculpture of Christ as the good shepherd and so on. Uh, but, you know, these things don't, don't happen all of a sudden. And here are some other examples. And this is Our Lady of Perpetual Help. And it's a Catholic Christian icon. And we see Christ again. He's not got the scroll and he's not giving the gesture of law. But the angels, this one here, reminding or letting Christ know of his ultimate fate, having the crucifix, having the cross right there. Oh, I wanted to, I forgot something here too, and that is that the Madonna enthroned was a symbol, the throne of wisdom. And so bottom line is that there is meaning in this 
enthroned. She's enthroned here. Christ is enthroned in her lap. And the idea of the throne will persist. And the early Byzantine Madonnas, a lot of them were dark blue or purple. Eventually, this will be blue. And that is uh, the idea of the symbolism of blue being pure and so on. Uh, and so here we go. This kind of gives you a step by step as we leave the Romanesque area. Mary ceases to be a throne. The child no longer sits centered on her lap and he's a human boy. And that's really what, what's going on. Again, Christ, a child, the gesture. But look at that. Take that face and pull it out. And you would say it was like probably about 50 years old got a receding hairline and everything. And so anyway, this is kind of a, a good sight, pretty accurate as far as I could see. And this is the Madonna. And let's see, am I, uh, you guys can still see that. Good. Yeah. All right, and so here it is. This is uh, th that word again, the Theotokos. Mary as the mother of God and the Christ child between the saints and early 7th century, late 16th century. Again, iconography, and this would have the cross. It's just deteriorate but if you look very carefully you can see that and again the child the man it's really pretty important uh, another uh, mosaic dedicated in 867 again like I said this turns blue Christ enthroned Madonna enthroned and it is the throne as I say, the throne of wisdom. And uh, you see, this is uh, from Moscow and it's uh, late 11th, early 12th century. So it's like, uh, I wanna show you something here. Early 12th century. So in 1054, we have something known as the Great Schism. Schism is a word that means split. And what we have here is this illustration with this, this diagonal line and everything to the east was relatively was Eastern Orthodox. Back in those days, Christian was Christian. They didn't talk about it being Catholic or Protestant, Baptist, fundamentalist, all that. It's all not the thing. The first split was between the Eastern Orthodox Christianity and its uh, area to the East. And that's, and sometimes this is called a Greek Orthodox, by the way. And the West, which practiced Catholicism. Now, this map is a little deceiving because it has purple areas in here that indicate where Protestant Christianity will arise. But that won't be yet for another 500 years. So Martin Luther was really the, and Jan Hus from the Czech Republic, they were the, they were the um, early Protestants, but, and we have, this is what I was talking about earlier, about the Christ, the gesture of administering law and the book 
or the scroll. That's really important. It's really important because the birth of Christ was in the Christian Bible predicted and anticipated in the Old Testament. In fact, uh, what we have here, and this goes back to the time of Constantine. Constantine talked about he was the one that really wanted to organize Christianity. He was the one that moved the capital over to Byzantium. That's why we're calling all of this Byzantine. Uh, what we're talking about here too is that, as I said last time, his mother, St. Helena, went on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem to collect all of the artifacts and identify the sites that were mentioned in, the, in what is today the Bible. And Constantine organized, is called the Council of Nicaea, it was in 325. See, this iconography is catching up with all of the things determined by the Nicene councils. But bottom line is, is that this was a council set up, and there were nine of them over time. And they were looking at all of the text and putting together a Bible. And they mostly spoke Greek, which is kind of interesting because we talk about the early church and the early Bible as being written in Greek. And so what they had was they had this collection of writings from all over the Middle East and they were authenticating them. See if they were fake, whether they were relative to the Bible, whether they should be included or not included. And so these are the people that decided that the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were the true Gospels. But there are other Gospels out there. Those of you who study Christian, uh, do Christian studies, know that there are these things called the Gnostic Gospels, Gospels, excuse me. Uh, the gospel according to St. Thomas, the gospels, you know, just all over the place. And so, anyway, they sorted all of that out. And if you're Catholic and you go to Mass, you will know that part of that Mass is the Nicene Creed, which is right out of what we're talking about here. And in Nicaea, they kind of wrote it down. What do you have to believe to be a Christian? And so that's what's recited at every Mass, the Nicene Creed. And these are the tenets of faith. This is what you have to believe if you're going to be a Christian. Now we talk about more as like being a Catholic, but because we have all other Protestant religions and other ways of being Christian. But at least 1,500, 1,800 years ago, that was the standard, the Nicene Creed. And so anyway, we got iconography developing. And this, like I say, was in Moscow. But again, where did I have that? That's over here. That's in the Eastern Orthodox tradition. And so, Monastery of St. Catherine, Mount Sinai, Egypt. This is where we have some of the earliest portrayals of Christ with all of the relative iconography. And so here we go. This is uh, Constantine the Ninth and Empress Zoe, and here it is, 500 years later. This was the 6th century, 
This is the 11th century. Christ with the book, his hand administering law, the halo, the cross, and again, this idea, this it does not go away. If you depict emperors and empresses, they have to be smaller and they have to be off to the side. If they're going to be in the same picture with Christ, Christ will have to be bigger. And so anyway, and you see Christ enthroned, and that's the symbol for wisdom. And this is in the Hagia Sophia as well, and it's just prior to the arrival of Islam in Turkey. And so anyway, this stuff, everything I'm talking about is so, becomes so well-defined and so standardized that there are people today who can teach you how to do Byzantine icon yourself. And these are different kinds of uh, lessons here. Um, doing the portrait, the garment, uh, so on, the iconography. And so this is a screenshot. This, and this is one guy. I uh, ran across him a few years ago teaching this same class. And I thought it was really pretty interesting. And he is an expert. He knows what all of the symbols mean. And he knows exactly why it was that these paintings look the way they do. And some of the things that I mentioned about how childlike should the Christ be, what gestures, what other symbols should be included. And so what we have here, and this is the Niceo Constantinopolitan Creed of 381. That's what I was talking about. Um, the Nicene Creed, uh, if you could read Old Greek, you would see it's very similar to the Nicene Creed we have today. Uh, there are in the Catholic religion what they call ecumenical councils, and they happen periodically, every century or every half century or something. And so anyway, a lot of times they refine, they refine the translation according to what they know, but it's essentially the same thing that you, that people, that Catholics recite in mass every time. And so what happens? I got these slides as well. This is vellum. Vellum is a paper. It's a very strong paper. It's uh, made from sheepskin. Have you ever heard the term sheepskin? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they call it as a diploma as a sheepskin because it was always put on that kind of very strong, durable paper. Uh, and so anyway, what we have here and coming out of the councils of Nicaea is that there's got to be, and especially with the wind at their back and Justinian at the helm, they start to see uh, the illuminated manuscripts start to flourish. They didn't have printing presses in the day. And so uh, basically they had typically monks writing down all of the important tenets of the faith, uh, handwriting Bibles and doing illustrations here. And I'll show you here, this is a, mostly an illustration here. Uh, uh, and 512 tempera on vellum. 
the story of Jacob. Verse so. And so anyway, what you have here, this is, if you were to open this book as it originally appeared, this would be on the left side, the verso, because it's on the back of the other page. The recto is on the right. That's what that means. Uh, and it's on, and they would do gold leaf and silver and everything. I mean, the story of Jacob is from the Old Testament complete with illustrations. Uh, Rebecca and Eliza at the well, recto, the right side, silver and purple, a silver, gold, tempera on purple vellum. And so this is really part of the artwork that survives. One of the things that we're not really seeing a whole lot of here is sculpture. And we're seeing a lot of mosaics, we're seeing paintings, and we're seeing arts in what we would say now bookmaking. Uh, and so anyway, they're making all of this stuff. It's a very important that they have the iconography standardized. So you don't want one version of the story of Jesus depicting Jesus in one way and in fact should be portrayed a different way. And so here we go, the ascension of Christ. This is from Syria, the gospel, the Robula Gospels. This is This is it, the ascension of Christ as he's being ascended into heaven. Uh, this, any guesses? Virgin Mary, the disciples watch the angels come lift Christ back to heaven. Anyway, tempera on parchment, 586. And so, yeah, this is how you can tell what this is basically because of the standardized icons. Uh, crucifixion and resurrection. And you see, sometimes they, they don't really, and this will happen all the way through, you know, Renaissance. Sometimes they don't really have a good idea of, of what things were like even five, 600 years prior. See, this is the tomb but that actually looks something like it comes out of Asia. It looks like, uh, looks Chinese to some extent. But at any rate, here's Christ resurrected from the tomb, the angels, and so on. Uh, this is later. And one of the things that you can see is that the skill of the painters actually really kind of generation to generation really uh, evolve. And so um, interior of the, see again, holding the book, doesn't have the sign of the administering the law, but this is 1100, we're still portraying Christ this way. Another portrayal, we have the iconography of the Virgin. Anybody know who this would be? Mary Magdalene? No, it's a guy actually. Um, good, good guess, actually Magdalene shows up in some of these others, by the way. Um, where did I see her anyway? Yeah, Magdalene being right there actually. Mm -hmm. And, but this, this is St. John the Apostle. He was the only apostle that didn't run away when Jesus was arrested and crucified. And he stayed there with the Virgin Mary. But you know, but you know this stuff and you see the wounds you see the bleeding, 
Uh, and so, Kiev, Ukraine, and this is a Christ. It's not exactly the same. It doesn't have the, but you see over here, we see the Virgin Mary and she's dressed in red. So what we have here, this is after, this is right around the time of the Great Schism. And this is kind of an indication that things are going on one path in the Eastern Church and another path in the Western Church. And so this is in the Western Church. It's called San Marco, but they, we call it St. Mark's quite often. It's a magnificent cathedral in Venice, begun in 1063. One of the things that we find here is that a lot of stuff from, from Turkey and the Middle East actually starts to appear in Italy. And there's a lot of issues going on because by 1105, we're starting to see the Crusades and we're starting to see Catholics wanting to take over the Holy Land, Catholic Christians, I should say. But at any rate, um, Archangel Michael. That's another thing too. I would be talking about uh, that was one thing that uh, they did in the councils of Nicaea. They identified the various angels. And so we got Michael, the archangel, and Raphael, and uh, anyway, Gabriel, uh, interior, Palermo. Italy, which is in Sicily, by the way, Christ enthroned, administering law, and carrying the holy book. Again, this is in Montreal, Montreal, Italy, and again, the Byzantine Madonna. And here it is, it's almost 1200 and we're talking like 600 years and still today these things would be recognized uh, and what happens here is that some of these things that were done in the 12th century they're still around when the renaissance comes to light when it arrives in the roughly the year 1400 and they look at a lot of this artwork this is something that looks quite a lot like a Giotto painting his lamentation it's almost composed the same way the angels are flying in the same way it's in the arena chapel and Giotto was considered to be sort of the father of the renaissance but things don't happen in a vacuum. They really rely quite heavily on, on this kind of work. And see, here we go, this is Istanbul 1310, we're in the 14th century here. And again, Christ as the savior of souls, giving the peace, the book, the beard, the halo. And so it's seven o'clock. I got a quiz for you guys. <laughs> the applause is like. Yeah, I got a quiz for you guys on Wednesday. And it's the same format that we've had. I'll show you a picture. You identify it. You tell me what the iconography is. And it is open source as usual, so you can look up what you don't know and back up what you do know. And finally, it'll ask for a bibliography or endnotes, however you want to do that. But citing your sources, 
And so, anybody know where Macedonia is? No. It's actually a country again. Uh, it's in northern Greece, by the way. Uh, but it wasn't a country for a long time because they were Macedonian separatists and the Greek government did not want to have part of their country taken away as Macedonia. Anyway, any more questions? Well, no questions. I have no answer. I'll see you guys. The quiz is going to be over the recent stuff we, since the last time we looked at last part of Rome. We looked at late antiquity and Byzantium. So it's going to be from that. And stay safe. Stay dry. All right.